when obstetricians come across cases of threatened miscarriage or recurrent pregnancy loss they will freely prescribe synthetic progestin preparations by various routes in order to sustain the disturbed pregnancy but there are many questions about this universal practice is this evidence based if yes then how long should one give progesterone the role of progesterone supplementation in reducing miscarriages and prevent threatened preterm labor remains unclear the aim of my talk is to summarize the evidence regarding the role of administration of exogenous progesterone preparations in the prevention of early pregnancy loss but before that some basic revision of physiology of early pregnancy the origin of the name progesterone is based on pro gestational activity of this steroid hormone indeed progesterone exerts several pro gestational effects prior to and throughout pregnancy prior to conception progesterone secreted by the corpus luteum promotes the development of secretory endometrium characterized by immunomodulatory paracrine and endocrine effects supporting the implantation of an embryo in early pregnancy progesterone is critical for the maintenance of pregnancy excising the corpus luteum early in pregnancy that is luteectomy results in decreased progesterone levels subsequently miscarriage can occur unless exogenous progesterone is administered in order to answer the second question how long should one prescribe progestins one needs to understand the phenomenon of luteal placental shift between 7 and 9 weeks of gestation a luteal placental shift occurs when the placenta takes over as the main progesterone producing organ as a result luteectomy conducted following 9 weeks of gestation does not result in a miscarriage in the second and third trimesters of pregnancy progesterone maintains uterine quiescence and acts as an immune modulator decreasing immune responses that could result in preterm labor but i am not going to discuss the role of progesterone in preterm labor in this talk overall the role of progesterone appears to be more critical in the first half of pregnancy than in the second half of pregnancy In the second and third trimesters of pregnancy, progesterone maintains uterine quiescence and acts as an immune modulator, decreasing immune responses that could result in preterm labor. But I am not going to discuss the role of progesterone in preterm labor in this talk. Overall, the role of progesterone appears to be more critical in the first half of pregnancy than in the second half of pregnancy. Before I discuss the topic proper, let me talk about how common is this condition. Early pregnancy loss affects 10 to 15% of clinical pregnancies and up to 31% of pregnancies in total. It can result in medical or surgical morbidity as well as psychological sequelae including post traumatic stress disorder, depression and anxiety. Women with a history of early pregnancy loss or those who present with bleeding in early pregnancy are a subgroup of patients at increased risk of miscarriage. Consequently, studies evaluating the role of progesterone in preventing miscarriage mainly focuses on these two subgroups. Vaginal bleeding in the presence of closed uterine cervix and with sonographic visualization of a viable intrauterine pregnancy is termed as threatened miscarriage. Low progesterone levels have been associated with an increased risk of miscarriage, but whether these low levels are the cause or solely the consequence of a failed pregnancy is unclear. The American Society for Reproductive Medicine (ASRM) and European Society of Human Reproduction and Embryology (ESRE) define recurrent pregnancy loss as the spontaneous loss of two or more pregnancies. Previous definitions required three or more pregnancy losses and thus studies comparing etiology, treatment and outcome differ with regard to recurrent pregnancy loss definition and therefore cannot be compared. The most common cause of early pregnancy loss is chromosomal abnormalities. They account for approximately 40% of early miscarriages with a lower prevalence in women with more advanced gestation and among those with recurrent pregnancy loss. Other possible causes of recurrent pregnancy loss include anatomical factors, immunological factors such as antiphospholipid syndrome and endocrinological factors especially PCOS. Yet even after comprehensive examinations and multiple investigations the cause of recurrent pregnancy loss can be determined only in less than 50% of cases. 
in majority that is in more than 50% of cases the cause is unknown it is these patients of recurrent pregnancy loss where the cause is unknown or undetermined the question of whether to give or not give synthetic progestins arises as progesterone is required for both implantation and the maintenance of pregnancy it has been postulated that a dysfunction in progesterone secretion or action could contribute to recurrent pregnancy loss the condition related to insufficient progesterone action is known as luteal phase deficiency it can be primary in which no cause is found that is idiopathic or secondary to other pathologies including thyroid and prolactin disorders ASRM guidelines suggest a clinical diagnosis of luteal phase deficiency with a luteal phase lasts for 10 days or less the guidelines also state that short luteal phases have been diagnosed in women who become pregnant and luteal phase deficiency has not proven to be as a cause of recurrent pregnancy loss even if the luteal phase is of adequate length supplemental progesterone might maintain an adequate immune environment in women with dysregulated response to the pregnancy now i will talk about some of the important trials that have been done to establish the role of progesterone in early pregnancy loss the largest trial promise trial evaluated 836 women between the ages of 18 and 39 with a history of three or more pregnancy losses patients in the study group received 400 micrograms of micronized progesterone twice daily from the time of positive urine pregnancy test until 12 gestational weeks the risk ratio for live births after 20 weeks of gestation in the progesterone treated group was 1.05 the live birth rate in the progesterone group was 66% whereas that in the placebo group was 63% the neonatal outcomes were comparable in the subgroup analysis no significant trend towards increased efficacy with increasing number of previous miscarriages was seen the same question was addressed in the 2019 prism trial it was a large multi center randomized double blind placebo controlled trial the study involved 4153 women aged 16 to 39 years who presented with vaginal bleeding in the presence of an intrauterine pregnancy of less than 12 weeks gestation the risk ratio of ongoing pregnancy at 12 weeks with 400 micrograms of twice daily vaginal micronized progesterone was 1.04 and of live births after at least 34 weeks was 1.03 a more pronounced effect was seen in those with a history of three or more miscarriages the live birth rates in the subgroup were 72% in the treated group and 57% in the placebo group because the analysis was done on a pre specified study group of 263 women the authors stated that the observation required validation a subsequent meta analysis comprising eight studies including the present trial and comprising 4833 patients found the relative risk ratio of miscarriage to be lower in women taking progesterone risk ratio of 0.7 with a confidence interval of 95% the quality of evidence however was considered very low and when limiting the analysis to only studies reporting live birth rates no significant difference was found with or without progesterone supplementation based on these studies let us now see what the various associations say current guidelines reflect the lack of certainty regarding progesterone treatment in threatened miscarriage the american college of obstetricians and gynecologists acog guidelines state for threatened early pregnancy loss the use of progestins is controversial and conclusive evidence supporting their use is lacking similarly the united kingdom's national institute for healthcare excellence guidelines affirm that the evidence is inconclusive but data from meta analysis of several small studies suggests that progesterones are better than placebo note that a persistent limitation of these studies is the inability to control the presence of better established causes of pregnancy loss such as aneuploidy 
the ASRM 2012 guidelines on the evaluation and treatment of recurrent pregnancy loss state that in patients with three or more conservative miscarriages immediately preceding their current pregnancy, empiric progesterone administration may be of some potential benefit. ACOG guidelines state that women who have experienced at least three prior pregnancy losses may benefit from progesterone therapy in the first trimester. ASHRAE guidelines take a different view. ASHRAE guidelines on recurrent pregnancy loss state that vaginal progesterone does not improve live birth rates in women with unexplained recurrent pregnancy loss and there is insufficient evidence to recommend the use of progesterone to improve live birth rates in women with recurrent pregnancy loss and luteal phase insufficiency. What about safety of progesterone? One factor that plays a role in a clinician's decision-making process apart from the specific treatment is treatment safety. In a case control study, progesterone supplementation was associated with an increased risk of hypospedias, odds ratio 3.7 and a confidence interval of 95%. However, the history of progesterone ingestion was evaluated by maternal interviews after birth with a risk of recall bias. In another case control study involving 402 patients, the use of didrogestron was associated with congenital heart defects, odds ratio 2.71 with a confidence interval of 95%. The study was also at risk of recall bias and did not control the indication for didrogestron treatment. To summarize, the PROMISE and PRISM trials found no evidence for an increased risk of congenital malformations in women taking micronized vaginal progesterone, although the studies were not powered to do so. This finding is reassuring. Despite limited data and low quality, both Cochrane reviews regarding threatened abortion and recurrent pregnancy loss found no increase in congenital anomalies in women treated with progesterone. In addition, control trials have shown no increased risk of congenital anomalies including genital abnormalities resulting from progesterone exposure in early pregnancy. Therefore, ASRM concluded that there is no evidence indicating that maternal exposure to progesterone, whether it is micronized progesterone or didrogestron, increases the risk of birth defects. Use of synthetic progesterone didrogestron from 1977 to 2005 showed no significant increased risk of birth defects. An estimated 10 million pregnant women received didrogestron during this period, also supporting the safety of didrogestron in pregnancy. Clinical studies of progesterone use during pregnancy, both oral and vaginal, support its tolerability and relatively minimal adverse effects. In conclusion, current evidence regarding the role of progesterone in early pregnancy is inconclusive. It is likely that progesterone has no role in the treatment of threatened miscarriage. It is plausible that in cases of unexplained recurrent pregnancy loss, progesterone may be of some benefit. Considering the apparent safety profile, it is not surprising that many obstetricians still recommend and administer such a treatment. Unfortunately, the evidence remains unclear and many questions such as the most appropriate indication, preferred dose, duration, route of administration, number needed to treat and cost effectiveness need further study. To understand this gross disparity between treatment based on peer-reviewed publications and actual practice where obstetricians still prescribe synthetic progestins in cases of early pregnancy loss as well as recurrent pregnancy loss, I will give an apt quote. Science is not peer-reviewed papers, that's academia. Let us all observe ground realities, think, discuss and arrive at an acceptable solution to the problem. This is science. I will put the same concept in another way. My way. There are two types of medicine. Evidence-based medicine that is based on randomized controlled trials published in peer-reviewed journals and experience-based medicine which is based on years of experience gained from actual clinical practice. Individually, they don't work. But combine the two and you have an acceptable practical solution to the medical condition you are treating. That is medical science, my friends. I rest my case.